There once was a young woman who lived in a fragrant pine forest. Her husband was away fighting a war for many years. When finally he was released from duty, he trudged home in a most foul mood. He refused to enter the house and kept to himself, staying in the forest day and night. His young wife was so excited when she learned her husband was coming home at last. She shopped and cooked, making dish after dish of tasty food. Smiling shyly, she carried the food to the woods and knelt beside her war-weary husband and offered him the beautiful food that she had prepared. But he sprang to his feet and kicked the trays over. Leave me alone, he roared and turned his back on her. He became so enraged, she was frightened of him. Time after time this occurred, until finally, in desperation, the young wife sought out the healer who lived on the outskirts of the village. She explained her problem and asked, Can you give me a potion that will make him gentle once again? The healer assured her, This I can do for you, but I need a special ingredient. I am out of tiger eyelash. So you must climb the mountain, find the tiger, and bring me back an eyelash. Then I will fulfill your request. Some women would have felt daunted by this task. Some women would have thought the entire effort impossible. But not she, for she was a woman who loved. I'm so grateful, she said. It is good to know that something can be done. So she readied herself for her journey, and the next morning she went out to the mountain. And she sang out, Arigato, which is a way of greeting the mountain and saying thank you for letting me climb upon your body. She climbed into the foothills where there were boulders like big loaves of bread. She ascended a plateau covered with forest. The trees had long draping bows and leaves that looked like stars. Arigato, she sang this to thank the trees as she passed underneath. And so she found her way through the forest and began to climb again. It was harder now. The mountain had thorny flowers that seized the hem of her kimono and rocks that scraped her hands. Strange dark birds flew out at her in dusk and frightened her. Still she climbed, for she was a woman who loved. She climbed till she saw snow on the mountain peak. Soon her feet were wet and cold, and still she climbed higher, for she was a woman who loved. A storm began, and the snow blew straight into her eyes and deep into her ears. Blinded still, she climbed higher. She took shelter in a shallow cave and could barely pull all of herself into it. She covered herself in leaves and slept. In the morning, the air was calm, and she thought, now, to find the tiger. She searched all day, and near twilight found the deep and terrible paw prints that she had been looking for. She followed them all the way to another cave, and there she saw the gigantic tiger heavily padding into its den. She reached into her bundle and placed the food she had brought in a bowl. With trembling hands, she set the bowl outside the den and ran quickly back to her shelter to hide. The tiger smelled the food and came out roaring so loudly it shook loose little stones. The tiger circled around the food from a distance, sampled the wind many times, then ate the food in one gulp. The next evening, the woman did the same, setting out the food, but this time, instead of returning to her shelter, she retreated only halfway. The tiger smelled the food and emerged from his cave and roared as if to shake the stars from the skies. He then gobbled up the food and crawled back into his den. This continued for many evenings, each time the woman coming closer and closer until one dark blue night she felt brave enough to wait very near the bowl of food. When the tiger smelled the food and lumbered out, it saw not only the bowl of food, but also a pair of small human feet. 
The tiger turned its head sideways and roared loudly. The woman trembled but stood her ground. The tiger roared again, its long teeth showing sharp and yellow. Oh, please, dear tiger, she pleaded. Please, I've come all this way because I need a cure for my husband. When the tiger remained silent, she continued in a stronger, steadier voice. Please, dear tiger, I've been feeding you all these past nights. Could I please have one of your eyelashes? The tiger paused. This woman would be easy food. Yet suddenly he was filled with pity for her. It is true, said the tiger. You have been good to me. You may take one of my eyelashes, but take it quickly and be on your way. Ask no more of me. The tiger sat down and held very still as the woman approached. She could see the golden eyes held a lighter rim of color, almost a soft green right near the black, black iris. Slowly she reached her hand toward the tiger's unblinking eye. She took a hold of one single glossy white lash, and before she could lose her determination, she quickly plucked it. The tiger let out a low growl and blinked. Oh, thank you, dear tiger. Thank you so much, the woman bowed. Go now, the tiger roared, his goodwill used up. The woman turned and fled down the mountain as fast as she could. She ran under the trees with leaves shaped like stars and over the boulders that looked like big loaves of bread, calling Arigato along her way. She ran down the stone stairs that led to the village, down the dirt road and right through the town to the other side and into the hut where the old healer sat tending the fire. Look, look, I have it. I claim the eyelash of the great tiger that lives up high in the mountains, she cried out. Ah, good, said the healer with a smile. He peered closely at the glossy white eyelash and held it toward the light. After much examination, the healer exclaimed, Yes, this is authentic tiger eyelash. Then suddenly the healer turned and threw it into the fire. <gasps> no, cried the young wife. What have you done? Be calm, said the healer. All is well. Remember each step you took to climb the mountain? Remember how you slowly and carefully won the trust of the great tiger who lives in the mountains? Yes, said the young woman, I remember very well. The old healer smiled at her gently and said, Now, my daughter, go home, and with your new understandings, proceed in the same ways with your husband. Rocky, a sweet, slightly over-the-hill boxer, is known in his town for winning his small-time fights more through fury than finesse. His daytime job is a collector for local loan shark Tony Gazzo, causing his trainer Mickey to accuse him of being a leg-breaker, telling Rocky that he has wasted his talent and is washed up. In the romance department, Rocky has been attempting to woo the shy, reclusive Adrian with little success. Reigning heavyweight champion Apollo Creed is coming to Rocky's town. A colorful attention seeker, Creed has a problem. His next opponent, set to fight him in five weeks' time, is injured, and no worthy contender can be arranged. He despairs of losing the media coverage and decides to launch an exhibition fight with a Philadelphia unknown on New Year's Day the first day of the country's bicentennial. Declaring that Americans will love the idea of an underdog ostensibly being given his big chance. He thumbs through a list of local boxers and pinpoints Rocky, whose self-appointed nickname is the Italian Stallion, as an interesting ethnic counterpoint. At the same time, Rocky gets his chance to spend some time with Adrian on Thanksgiving Day. Her brother, Polly Panino, has invited Rocky over to share their dinner. 
but upon entering Polly's house, he realizes that Adrian is unaware of the setup. Embarrassed, she declares herself unready for guests, prompting Polly to explode in anger, calling her a loser and throwing her turkey dinner into the alleyway. Although she locks herself in the bedroom in response, Rocky urges her to come out and takes her to a closed ice skating rink where he convinces the manager to open briefly. As Adrian skates, Rocky trots alongside her and they begin to talk. When he confesses that his father told him he had no brains, so had better work with his body, Adrian reveals that her mother told her to develop her brains as she didn't have a good body. Walking to his apartment afterward, he asserts that their weaknesses make them perfect partners. At his stoop, she tries to leave, but he charms her into staying, and their evening ends with a passionate kiss. The next day, Rocky learns from Mickey that Creed's promoter, Miles Jerkins, wants to meet with him, and both assume Creed is looking for a sparring partner. At Jerkins' office, Rocky is stunned to learn that he is being offered a chance at the heavyweight championship, but quietly turns down the opportunity, knowing he has no possibility of winning. However, Jurgens convinces him that he cannot pass up the chance of a lifetime, and soon after that, the bout is announced on television. Rocky immediately begins a self-imposed, grueling training schedule running through the city at 4 a.m. On his first day, he ascends the steep stone stairs of the Philadelphia Museum of Art and is exhausted by the time he reaches the top. He stops by Polly's meatpacking plant where Polly, as is customary, pesters him for a job with Gazzo. When Polly questions him angrily whether or not Rocky has slept with Adrian, Rocky pushes him away and takes out his frustration by punching a frozen carcass until his fists bleed. Each day, Rocky executes his early morning routine, running through the neighborhood and ending with the museum stairs. Finally, after weeks of exertion, he is able to ascend them with ease and at the top throws up his hands in triumph. On the night before the fight, Rocky tells Adrian that it doesn't matter if he loses, if he can just last all 15 rounds, as no one ever has against Creed, he will know for the first time that he is more than just another bum from the neighborhood. After Adrian falls asleep, he slips out and visits the empty arena in which he will be boxing Creed, stealing himself for the upcoming fight. On the day of the fight, as the arena fills, Rocky prays, then banters with Adrian. As he enters the ring, the announcers report that some have called the bout the caveman versus the cavalier, and that the Las Vegas odds assume that Rocky will be knocked out within three rounds. Next, with great fanfare, Creed, throwing money to the crowd, enters the arena, costumed as George Washington on a boat. Then the fight begins. Creed, overconfident, is far quicker than Rocky and jabs at him tauntingly. But when Rocky lands an unexpected strong hit, felling Creed for the first time ever, the champion returns with renewed vigilance. He begins to pummel Rocky, and when Rocky manages to back Creed up against the ropes, Creed breaks his nose. During the ensuing bout, Rocky takes a tremendous beating, but continually rebounds to land a few hard punches. Fourteen rounds later, both are exhausted, but still fighting with equal commitment and have suffered multiple injuries. Rocky keeps struggling to his feet, even as the commentators wonder what could possibly be keeping him up. Mickey demands that he give up. In their respective corners, Rocky demands that his cut man slice his eye with a razor to drain it of blood, while Creed orders his trainer to let the fight continue. 
and 15 rounds finally draw to a close and the crowd roars its approval. As the reporters swarm him with questions, Rocky bats them away and shouts for Adrian. She runs toward him, slowed by the crowd. When she finally reaches Rocky, she falls into his arms, flush with his own personal victory, and barely even registering that the fight has been called for Creed, Rocky declares his love for Adrian. So what do these two stories have in common? They are both stories of perseverance. The protagonist of each wants something. The young wife wants the return of her former relationship. Rocky wants to be more than just a bum from the neighborhood. Through persistence and determination, through faith and hope, both the young wife and the boxer discover clues to achieving their dream. The story of the young wife takes us on a layered journey where climbing of mountains can represent the mental and spiritual stamina required of one who is stretching toward a goal. The snow-driven wind may be the harsh criticism and pressures from society as well as overcoming self-doubt. The slow winning over of the ferocious tiger can symbolize the importance of timing and patience and bravery. The ultimate lesson being that the essence of the journey is to discover self-mastery. The story of Rocky on the surface seems less nuanced. However, as we look more closely, we see similarities between the stories. When Rocky taxes himself to his physical limits to prove to himself that he is worthy, Symbolically, those are his mountains to climb. He too encounters the cold winds of ridicule and shame that batter his ego, teaching him to continue on, much like the young wife seeking the tiger's eyelash, who refuses to relinquish her quest. The patience and timing in his boxing match with Apollo Creed, again, is like the wooing of the tiger with food. Rocky may not have technically won his match at that time with Creed, but using the tools he learned on his journey, he did eventually win and then defend his title in the ongoing saga that was the Rocky franchise. I love both of these stories and was delighted when I could play with the theme of tigers, the woman getting the tiger's eyelash and the boxer whose most memorable theme song is the Eye of the Tiger. Both central characters exhibiting bravery, endurance, and persistence in overcoming obstacles on their own path to personal achievement. I almost didn't do this video. I struggled for weeks to find matching images and began to doubt that I was supposed to do this. Honestly, my other videos flowed out easily, but then I had what I referred to as a lot of windshield time, driving to out of the way places, way, way out of the way places for my job. I downloaded an audiobook whose title had caught my fancy, Big Magic. Talk about the right message at the right time. As I listened to the author discuss her path of being a writer, I knew that this was a signal that I should continue working on my Tiger video. Gilbert, who is famously known for her book, Eat, Pray, Love, playfully encourages us to see inspiration, which I envision with a capital I, in our lives and follow it. Each of us, she asserts, is a child of God and therefore creators in our own right. This is something I have felt deep within my bones for as long as I can remember. And we don't have to claim this right of being creators for just the big projects, writing that novel, composing the masterpiece, or whatever. That each of us is divinely gifted to create beauty in whatever we do. That we should follow our joy and declare, I am a creator 
as we crochet a blanket for a shut-in, open a new business, lovingly carve a piece of wood, or raise confident, happy children. Whatever we do, we create. We should do it unapologetically, with great joy and gusto. So here it is, this video, and I end with this message. Go create, be it big or small, which is just what we tell ourselves, that it's very, very big, too big, or it's very, very small, really insignificant. Nonsense. If it inspires you, do it. And don't give a rat's ass what anyone else says. Delight yourself first and foremost. Bring that joy into whatever inspires you. I remember the absolute happiness I got when I finally organized a closet that had been driving me crazy. Small potatoes, right? Also, the joy I experienced when I finally published my first book, a big and scary project. It is all good. Pursue your dreams. Be a creator. Have a good day.